All right, I'm going to talk about normal fracture healing. And bone is the only tissue in the body that truly heals. And by that, I mean when a fracture heals, it heals with normal bone, not with scar tissue. So if you had a stroke or you had a heart attack and you recovered from that, you wouldn't develop normal myocardium. You'd develop a, a myocardial scar or, or gliosis. But in bone, if healing goes correctly, the new tissue that forms is actually normal bone. And this is sort of magical. And it happens in five histologic stages that we'll go through. And at each of these stages, we resorb the product that was made from the previous stage. And the cells that are there differentiate into something new and then form new product for the next stage. And there's several regulators of this process, including growth factors, especially those released from platelets, motion and mechanical stresses, oxygen, electrical charge, and possibly free radicals. So here are the stages. And what happens initially with a fracture is there's a hematoma and there's dead bone. The first stage is the inflammatory stage. Uh, so at this point, macrophages come in and they resorb the dead bone. And then the macrophages differentiate into fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts then will replace the hematoma with granulation tissue. The fibroblasts then differentiate into chondroblasts and they turn the granulation tissue into calcification, uh, which is the beginning of callus. The, the cartilage, rather, cartilage will calcify. That's callus. And then the chondroblasts form osteoblasts. And the osteoblasts will turn that cartilage eventually into bone. That'll at first be woven bone or immature bone. And then through the processes of remodeling uh, and reshaping, that bone will become more mature over time, form lamellar bone, and reestablish the medullary space. Now, the radiographic findings of, of fracture healing start with widening of the fracture line. And this happens in the first 10 to 14 days. And this represents that stage where the dead bone is being carted away. Now, we see this as blurring of the fracture ends as well as widening of the line. Uh, but note that widening of the fracture line is the first stage of both normal and abnormal fracture healing. So at this point, we don't know if healing is going to proceed normally or not. So here's a, a patient, an acute fracture, the fifth metatarsal. Twelve days later, we can see that thin, sharp line has become a wider line. That can be fairly advanced. Here's a fracture of the talus, a transchondral fracture, where we've had a lot of bone resorption along that fracture line that can still be normal or abnormal at this stage. We can't tell. So how do we tell? We follow it over time. So here's a lateral malleolus fracture initially. At three weeks, that fracture line is getting wider, so we don't know what's going to happen. But at nine weeks, we can see now normal fracture healing is starting to narrow down again, and that will go on to heal. The second major finding of, of healing is callus formation. And the earliest callus formation, we recognize at around two weeks. It initially is immature bone, and that looks like fluffy, very indistinct bone. Over time, that will become denser, more organized, and will eventually bridge the fracture and then ossify. Now, that's for the callus on the outside. The callus on the inside uh, of the fracture we recognize as obliterating the fracture line. You want to be very careful in a case where operative reduction is be done and it's a perfect reduction and the fracture line disappears immediately. That doesn't necessarily mean it's healed. We have to see bone going from point A to point B. So this is the earliest callus you're going to see, very indistinct sort of cotton candy looking uh, new bone formation here on CT at two weeks. Here's what it would look like early on radiographs here at six weeks. It's this very faint, cloudy new bone formation that's formed in the cracks of the, the sides of the fracture. And we can see how that progresses over time. So here's our initial fracture here at two months. This indistinct callus formation hasn't bridged yet. Uh, we follow that further here at three months. We can see it's starting to coalesce and bridge, but not mature yet. Following that further here at five months in this particular fracture, we have now reestablished the cortex. We have mature bone forming on the outside, starting to reestablish the medullary space. Notice, by the way, in this case, that that skin desmotic screw has fractured. 
That doesn't mean it's necessarily abnormal. That means we have motion between the distal tibia and fibula, but that's okay. We're not trying to fuse those two joints. Uh, and then finally, at eight months, we can see it's remodeled into pretty much normal looking bone here. So how much callus there is depends on several factors. Fractures of larger bones, where there's a bigger hematoma to start with, are going to have uh, more callus formation. Fractures that occur in the shafts of bones, same thing. Fractures where there's motion while it's healing will have more callus formation. So a fracture treated with a splint or cast will typically have more callus formation than one that's treated with rigid internal fixation. Fractures in multiple parts have more substrate to form more callus. A fracture that's infected can still heal, but will heal with more callus formation. And then finally, a patient who has increased steroids, either endogenously from Cushing's disease or exogenously from their medications, will have increased callus. And the opposite is true as well. Small bones will have less callus, fractures in the metaphysis instead of in the diaphysis, fractures where there's impaction will have less, less callus, and those that are rigidly in, internally fixated. So when do we say then a fracture is healed? Well, a fracture union is actually a clinical diagnosis. So this is not done radiographically. And the clinicians will look to make sure there's no tenderness at the fracture site. There's no motion at the fracture site if they grab each side of the bone and try to move it. And that the bone is stable. And for a lower extremity bone, that means that the, it can support weight without support. Now, at this stage, there's actually too little bridging bone for us to see it radiographically. Radiographically, we say a fracture is healed when there's a contiguous external bridge of mature callus formation, um, and there's reestablishment of the medullary space, obviously, unless we have intramedullary fixation, but this occurs way after clinical fracture union has occurred. So here's a femur fracture at four months. We would say this is radiographically healed. There's mature external bridge of ossification bridging the entire fracture. Uh, and this, in fact, had healed several months before, and the patient's been walking on it. Notice, by the way, that it's still not remodeled. It doesn't look like normal bone yet, but that's okay. It's plenty strong to walk on now. 11 months later, it's looking more like normal bone. Sometimes the callus formation doesn't entirely bridge a fracture, and that's okay. We can get left with these post-traumatic cysts like you see here because the callus formation has skipped over a part. You probably only need about 25% of the fracture to be bridged to be strong enough to be healed. So how long does it take for a fracture to heal? And this is very variable. I'm giving you some examples here in an adult these are just averages, and notice a clavicle might be healed in three weeks, whereas a tibia could take up to a year and a half to completely heal. And what factors affect how quickly a fracture heals uh, include how much soft tissue trauma there is, whether the fragments are vascularized or not. So a open fracture will heal more slowly. A fracture that uh, is segmental in the middle fragment has lost its blood supply will heal more slowly. Older patients, not surprisingly, heal more slowly than younger patients. The method of treatment matters. So fractures that are rigidly internally fixated will heal faster than those that are treated with a cast or traction. Um, of the bigger the fracture gap, obviously, there's a longer space that the callus has to go across. So that's going to take longer. Fractures that are moving take longer. Fractures that are infected take longer. And if there's underlying bone disease, that will slow healing as well. So a fracture that occurred through bone that's been radiated before or, say, has Paget's disease can still heal, but will take longer to get better. And then finally, intraarticular fractures heal more slowly, and that's because synovial fluid actually uh, resists, slows down new bone formation. And then patients who have increased steroids either endogenously or exogenously will heal more slowly. Now, there's one feature we should talk about, uh, fracture healing, that is a radiographic finding, and that's disuse osteoporosis. And this is part of normal fracture healing. It's acute osteoporosis. It typically happens at and distal to the fracture site. It usually commences about a month or two after immobilization. Uh, and once the patient starts walking again or using their extremity, 
the reversal will take just as much time as it took to uh, develop, but at least four weeks. We see this on a bone scan, for example. If you did a three-phase bone scan, the first phase represents the, the acute osteoporosis phase. Uh, and even though this is a normal part of fracture healing, the bone is still weak. So it is a risk for insufficiency fractures, and that's something we need to look for in the elderly. Some people think this is also related to reflex sympathetic dystrophy, in that RSD is actually disuse osteoporosis, where the signal in the body to turn off the osteoporosis never got there, so it just runs amok. So this is typical progression of disuse osteoporosis after a hind foot fracture, and we can see that the bones are basically slowly melting away uh, up to 16 weeks here. Well, what are the patterns that let us recognize disuse osteoporosis? Some patients will just have generalized osteopenia, but that's unusual. Most will have one of these other patterns. One is metaphyseal resorptive bands. And what this is, is in the metaphyses, we see this swath of bone where it looks like it's just been erased. Very characteristic of disuse osteoporosis. A second pattern is preferential resorption of bone subcortical and endosteal. So here in this patient with a distal tibial fracture, it looks like the Taylor cortex or even the calcaneal cortex is just floating in the breeze because we've had selective resorption of bone right underneath the cortex. You can develop a spotty form of osteoporosis that looks a lot like multiple myeloma. This is a, a type that occurs in adults, but never in children. So example here, this patient had a proximal femur fracture and we can see multiple holes developing in the distal uh, bones much more prevalent here if we look at it on CT. And then finally, intracortical tunneling is another feature of disuse osteoporosis, where we have selective resorption now inside the cortex of the bones at or distal to the fracture site. And really, all these findings of disuse are really nonspecific findings of rapid bone turnover. So anyone else with rapid bone turnover, for example, with hyperparathyroidism, might show the same findings. So in summary, normal fracture healing, there's a predictable progression of the different findings, uh, and we should go from one stage to, to the next, but there's a variable time course, and that depends on a lot of different factors. From the radiologist's point of view, seeing callus formation and being able to describe it is really the key findings, and you need sequential films to make sure that changes in the fracture line and changes in the amount and type of callus are going in the correct direction.